Thank you, Tim. We, we should be presenting in series, not in parallel. So I'll start by talking about the State of the Archaeological Market Report. This is the report on the State of the Market for Archaeological Services using data that were gathered, collected with a census date of the 31st of March, 2022. So, okay, admittedly, this is already more than a year old. So this has only just been completed. That has made me think a little bit about how, how we need to catch up on this so that we will be looking to gather the data for, for the year ending March this year, soon, this summer. And then, if we can, we'll try to gather the data for 24 in the quarter of, the, of 2024, starting 1st of April and leading up to the end of June. So that in theory, next year when we come to Fame Forum, even if you don't get a presentation like this, we'll be able to talk about it at the AGM as an update on actually where we are in 2024, talking about 2024. Okay, so to move on. Nope. Nope. Yes. Um, okay, this, so this report is now published. It's on FAME website as of this morning. At the end of the presentation, there'll be a QR code if you want to follow that to get there. The, here's the headline slide that the, at the moment, the, or rather in 2022, we thought there was 4,800 people working in commercial archaeology in the UK. That is 72% of all the people working in archaeology in all sectors at that point. So it, it's a useful reminder to us and to partners and to other organizations that commercial archaeology really is archaeology. Everything else is really quite small scale in comparison with the, the number of people and the amount of work that goes on here that the, the sector was on typically turning a profit, that the proportion of people working in UK archeology span who come from the European Union has been declining for the last five years. There's perhaps no surprise about that. Uh, almost everyone has a permanent contract. The transport is the biggest market sector in, in past years, I'll talk about this in a little bit more, in past years it has very often been housing that has been the biggest source of revenue, but that last year it was, it was transport, and transport has come right up the, the, the league table there in the last few years, and it is not just because of High Speed 2, but in large part because of High Speeds 2. And the total value of development-led archaeology in the UK in 2022, we reckon, is £268 million. Pounds. So a quarter of a billion pounds is spent on commercial archaeology every year. Here's the quick numbers about the number of staff. As you see, the, yeah, okay, that is, that is just about legible. Some of the tables later will not. Um, so there, we got information back about 2,400 people. We extrapolated up. Typical, your average sized organization now in commercial archaeology employs 76 people, average. That's the mean number, that isn't the median number. That doesn't mean that there's half companies are employ more and half employ less than that. And so overall, with a little bit of careful calculations and careful considerations, we reckoned that the sector, commercial archeology, span had a net increase of 100 people working in commercial archeology span over the year from 21 to 22 an increase of 2.2%. I think many of you in this room will acknowledge that there, okay, rem remembering that we've had more than a year go by since these data were collected. So remembering this is at the end of financial year 21, 22, this is the end of the second pandemic year. This is right at the point where the Construction Leadership Council is about to say that all restrictions on on construction work are about to be lifted the day after we collect this data. So this is all about the second year of the pandemic. And if we cast our minds back, the, the two pandemic years were, I think many people might agree, unbelievably busy, and it was unbelievably difficult to hire people. And so actually that the, the overall staff capacity of the sector did increase was uh, an achievement. 
There's, these are figures from going back to yesteryear and utterly unreadable, but there's the figure for commercial archaeology, 4,800 people, all archaeology, 6,700 people. There's a graph looking at the number of people working in, in UK archaeology just going back to 2007, so just before the, the Great Recession crash. We are now at a point in 22 when there were more people working in UK archaeology and more people working in commercial archaeology than there had ever been at any point before that. There's the figures about nationalities. At that point, 87% of commercial archaeologists were UK uh, subjects, 10% were EU citizens, and that had declined from there being 15% of archaeologists five years previously had been from other EU countries, from EU countries. The, the amount of money flowing through, okay, so we got figures about turnover from individual companies. We've worked out uh, medians and means. The mean, the average amount that an archaeology company would have flowing through in a year was six million pounds, 6.6 .6 million pounds. But the median so half of companies had less turnover than this and half had more, it was about two million pounds. And money was unsurprisingly being primarily generated from work in England. So this is, that is not a surprise. So on the basis of knowing how much turnover there was and knowing how many people there were, we calculate what is the average turnover per member of staff. And we think that's at somewhere about 56,000 pounds per member of staff. And that is from where we calculate the total value of the sector, the total amount of money going through it, 268 million pounds last year. Last year, 22. And there's a difficult to read uh, table, but it is pointing out that at the top of that list, transport as a, a sector accounted for 39% of the funding on, on projects across commercial archaeology that year, versus 32% for residential development. Whereas if we go back to 2016, the earliest of figures there, residential development was more than 50% then. Or in 2017, transport was only 6%. So we, I'm telling you things you already know, but transport projects have become so, so important in recent years. We asked about how charge out rates had changed. And this is a very interesting figure that it, we worked out on average across the sector, charge out rates in that year, 21, 22, had gone up by 6.8% on average. Okay, but inflation was 7%. So charge out rates weren't even keeping up, not quite keeping up with inflation. The, we asked about salary level changes, and there we see that 84% of respondents said that their salaries had gone up by inflation or more, which is, of course, good. Good in terms of the outcome for the says individual workers, but that suggests that average salary rates had gone up by at least 7%, whereas average charge-out rates had only gone up by 6.8%. And this implies a little bit of a disconnect there in the amount of income and expenditure. On average, companies were reporting a profit. Not everyone reported a profit. Some reported a, a loss, but the average level of profit was about 7%. And we have some calculated numbers for that. The, but there we go, 7% is average, but 46% of companies, so half of companies, were getting less than 5% profit, which is not very sustainable. Looking to the future, because a lot of those data are, were retrospective, this is what people thought in 22 about what the next year would bring. More people thought the next year, which has now ended, of course, year 22, 23, more people thought things would get worse than thought it would get better. And this is interesting when we look at this same question asked over time. The, there has been quite a, an ebb and flow of attitudes to ex expectations of the market in the next year. It is interesting that you can look at particular years and actually map particular political events onto it. You can map on 
the downturn in expectations when the referendum was announced. You can map, honestly, you can map downturns in expectations when general elections take place. It is then so interesting that the second last bar on, on that chart, which is 2021, so that was what did people think after one year of pandemic? Almost everyone thought things have got to get better. Things must be better next year. And then they kind of weren't. Although, well, they were because we were unbelievably busy, but we were overworked. And so after another year of pandemic, as people look forward, people are back to being quite glum about the, the future. So I think that I have one more uh, slide about thinking about future perceptions. That people, we ask of, of the standard sets of questions, and it is interesting that people thought, a very, very high proportion of, of respondents thought that a shortage of heritage staff in local planning authorities is a problem. It's a constraint on projects. And so, and I'm, I'm glad to be able to provide these information to our Algeo partners to, to reassure them that FAME recognises the importance of well and appropriately staffed local planning authority archaeology services. It also, we also found the other big, big issue is hiring and that most respondents had had vacancies that were hard to fill. And so we continue to find it difficult, even when the, even when the industry is, is doing well and there is good revenue and there is a little bit of profitability, it is still difficult for us to hire. And this, as I think we all know, has me meant that organic growth, so just growing a company by hiring more people than leave, has become difficult. And we are very much into a, a phase where mergers and acquisitions is being a more popular route to growing a company. I think that concludes my half of this little, little presentation. Thank you to our funders there, that's to, to Sifa. I looked directly at Kate Geary at that point. Thank you, Sifa. And uh, also to Historic Environment Scotland. I, there's the QR code to grab that report, but you can just go to the FAME website and it's on the front page there now. So I will, that, with that, hand over to Doug for his you, presentation. You can keep that QR code up for a moment. Okay, I will keep up the QR. If anyone really wants it. Oh, I, I see some people. All right. Hopefully I'm on the camera as well. Um, all right. So as part of um, the state of the market survey, we also have combined our health and safety, health and safety survey into that so that you are not filling out half a dozen different surveys um, every other month. So I am quickly going to go through some of the findings of the health and safety. Uh, some of the data we collect are on uh, Ritter injuries um, reported. Uh, this is just to go over, um, so there's two ways of looking at these injuries. That is by the number of people who work or the number of hours worked. Um, this, there's actually a massive list. We've just shown right there the top two worst industries in terms of injuries, um, top two best or bottom two, I don't know how you want to think about that, um, industries in terms of injuries, and then to show roughly where we are, which is we're right around, we're a little bit better than um, construction. This kind of makes sense. That higher construction category actually includes things like architects. So it is people who are mainly primarily based in the office, and then people who are out on construction sites, which I think is a good reflection of what we experience um, and development-led archaeology. This has taken us a couple of years to average out because we are a very small sector and essentially one rider injury has a huge effect on our numbers, uh, on the way that they're calculated. Uh, so the example we use is if two people were walking along, tripped, well, carrying something, tripped, both fell over, got hurt, and it was rider, they would probably send our rider numbers through the roof for that year. Um, we're really talking about just a handful of injuries each year that are writer reportable. Uh, so that means it's taken us about four years to put together all this information to sort of average us out to figure out we're a little bit better than the construction industry. Um, probably at the next uh, health and safety meeting, we'll be discussing the statistics and which ones we collect. 
Ryder is a good one because everyone has to collect it um, legally. But if it takes us four or five years to be able to notice a difference and have to average things out, um, that doesn't really tell us a lot. And that um, if something was to be going wrong in the industry, it could take us half a decade or another, or even a decade before we notice. Um, we also are collecting non-rider injuries. Um, uh, so these are non-rider reportable ones. We have some categories there. Um, basically, manual handling is the number one cause. Uh, this year, we added a category um, essentially talking about injuries that are repetitive but don't show up as an incident um, that people are recording. Um, so that's in there as well. We're not doing too good on near misses. Um, in a sense, you should have many, many more times near misses than you do incidents to be able to track and improve. We People are tracking about three times as many actual injuries as there are near misses. So as a sector, we're not doing too well on tracking near misses. Something new we've done this year as we're starting to look at mental health and try to see what statistics there might be. Um, we asked respondents if they are tracking mental health incidents. <coughs> most of the people who uh, fill out the survey are, um, and they represent most, uh, the only people who weren't were very small organizations. Um, one problem though for future statistics is this is just a list of all the different ways that people are tracking the statistics on mental health in our sector. And you can see there is no standard at all. Almost the, the closest we get is maybe two organizations um, are tracking them through a mental health first aid program. Uh, but for the most part, there is no standardization. Everyone's looking at this in a different way, tracking it in a different way. Uh, so in the future, we're going to have to have a real, real long think about how we're going to be able to track these um, incidents. And we also asked how people are supporting mental health in the sector. Um, most, the biggest one is actually a lot of people are using the mental health first aider program. Um, some of these, just because it was an open um, response and you could write what you want, I actually suspect some of these things, so like an EAP might be the same as like a counseling or a, a helpline. So, that could be the next biggest one. Um, we might have to ask more specific questions in the future. Again, this was sort of a fact-finding effort to see how people are supporting mental health. Um, more people than not are doing mental health first aiders programs. Uh, but again, it's all over the place in terms of how we are, are supporting our staff in mental health. And that's pretty much the highlights of our health and safety. Um, survey really quick if you want to again it's on the website there's a link you can download